A lot of players are really good at practice, but then when it comes to tournament time, they play absolutely horrendous in the tournament. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that they don't understand the why behind what they do. And there is a why behind every shot, strategy, and position in pickleball. There are seven basic pickleball tactics that if applied to your game will automatically take you to the next level. Number one, drive to set up, drop to move up. A lot of people think that a drive, which is a ground stroke for those of you that don't know, that's what a drive looks like. A lot of people think that that drive is to win the point. We're trying to beat our opponents. We're trying to outpower them, make them feel uncomfortable, or simply hit to the open court and hit a winner. Now, it absolutely is that, but it's only that about 2% of the time. The other 98% of the time, it's a setup shot, meaning it's setting us up to be able to hit an easier drop so that we can then move forward into the kitchen because that's what a drop is. That's the whole why behind the drop is that it allows us to be able to move in because it allows us that time to move in. Whereas with the drive, it's moving so quickly, it gets to our opponents so quickly that it comes back to us just as quick. So we're driving that ball in hopes that they pop the ball up or leave it short in the court that we can then not come in and drive the ball again because that's not gonna work. We only know that's gonna work about 2% of the time. We're going to drop the ball and then move forward to a more optimal position. So remember that the drive is to set you up. It's not to win the point. The ball is going to come back and pick a ball. It always seems to come back. Be ready for that setup so that you can then drop the ball and then move up. Now I'm gonna show you a few points where you can see the drive setting up the drop so that both players can move forward towards the kitchen. And while I do that, I'm gonna tell you about this video sponsor, BetterHelp. As many of you know, balancing work life, family life, and pickleball life can be super overwhelming, especially when you're in a sport where your mind's continually focused on results and when those results aren't always great. It might not seem like it, but creating videos for you and making sure that I am improving my pickleball game and that I'm preparing for tournaments can trigger a whole lot of anxiety in me. And that's why I'm super excited to be partnering with BetterHelp. They provide online therapy that is convenient, flexible, and it's also tailored to your specific schedule. And that's whether you're in between games or you're struggling to balance work life and family life like I am. So if you wanna try it out, be sure to go to betterhelp.com forward slash pickleball playbook to get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp. Trust me when I say they'll make it a great experience for you and the best part about it is that it will automatically translate to improving your mental game, which accounts for about 80% of how you perform out on the court. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring the video and don't forget to go to betterhelp.com forward slash pickleball playbook to get 10% off your first month. Number two, play cross court majority of the time. So a lot of players don't really go in with a strategy whenever they're playing in a tournament, which obviously is super bad, or they go in with a strategy and they just use it because they were taught by a coach to use it, but they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Like I said before, that's the most important part, but you want to hit cross court and here's the why, because you have more court to work with whenever you hit cross court. If we're dinking up the line, for instance, you have 14 feet in between you and your opponent on the other side of the line. Whereas if you're dinking cross court, you have in between 20 and 22 feet to dink cross court. So you get an extra six to eight feet by just simply dinking cross court. Obviously this is gonna lead to greater consistency. As you can see the kitchen here, we're gonna be up at the net dinking against our opponents. We're trying to keep the ball cross court. We don't wanna to go too far cross court. So where should we draw that line? Something that I like to do is rather than aim for the line, I aim a foot in from the line because if you miss the line, the ball is either inside the court or it's out of the court. So you have a 50-50 chance. Whereas if you aim a foot in, your chances now go way up. So if I hit a ball and it lands, let's say right here, okay? kind of the corner of the kitchen. We're close to that back line. This ball could be an ATP, but chances are it's not going to be because it's so far back towards the kitchen line. Now, on the other hand, if I hit a ball even just a foot in from that, this ball's chances of being ATP'd are a whole lot higher. And then obviously the further in that I move that ball, the easier that that ball is gonna be to ATP. The further back, way harder to ATP and actually keep into the court. So you wanna use that one foot rule. So you don't wanna aim short in the kitchen and out wide when you're hitting cross. You wanna aim a foot from this line or somewhere in between there, as well as a foot from this line. That will push your opponent off the court so that you can then speed it up through the middle because there's gonna be a huge gap here whenever you pull them out wide. So try to go for that foot. If you go beyond that foot, they're probably gonna ATP that ball. But remember, you have so much more room to work with whenever you're dinking cross court 
in comparison to directly up the line. Number three is where you should be standing at all times. And tons of people get this wrong. They'll be standing in the wrong position and then they're just getting passed left and right. So this applies to both sides of the court. If I'm the right side player or if I'm the left side player, we're just gonna act like I'm the left side player for this example. So if I am dinking cross court, whenever I dink the ball cross court, I need to now come and hug the middle of the court. In other words, I'm following the ball. I wanna act like a string is connected between me and my partner, as well as the ball. If the ball goes to the right, we're both going to move towards the right. He's gonna now cover the line. I'm gonna cover the middle, just in case they speed it up here. What am I leaving open? Obviously, this side of the court over here, this cross court angle, which they can only dink. They cannot speed up this ball because if they speed it up, it's gonna hit the fence. They have to dink the ball. So that gives me time to get back and dink that ball again cross court and then I'm gonna hover over the middle. So anytime that I dink to a certain location, I'm going to follow the ball towards that location. If you dink to the left, follow the ball towards the left. Don't let your feet be stuck in cement like I see so many players do. They dink the ball and then they just stay in the center of their box. They dink the ball, they don't follow where it goes. If I dink over here, I'm over here. If I dink to the middle, I'm over here. If I dink cross court, I'm over here and sometimes I'm going over that line because maybe I dinked it way out wide. My partner's covering an ATP and I'm gonna be here to smash that next shot. Number four is to change the direction of the ball. So obviously we're not gonna hit every single ball cross court and there are some reasons why we all of a sudden wanna change it from cross court to then hitting it directly up the line. Now for this same example, let's say that I'm dinking with my opponent. I dink the ball cross court. We're in a cross court dink exchange and he's coming out on top of all of those, or majority of them. His backhand dink is way better than mine. What I need to do is change the direction of the dink to now up the line here to this opponent. Now that opponent has two options. They can either hit the ball back to me, or they can go for the more consistent option and hit it to my partner right here. So hopefully that makes sense. They're gonna be going for the most consistent option majority of the time, unless they're really targeting me which if you target someone, you have to be really honed in because if he slightly pops up the ball, since we're so close to each other, I can then put that ball away. So this is a great strategy to change the direction of the ball whenever we're losing in those cross court dink battles. I put it up the line, his next shot's gonna go cross court, and now they're in a dink exchange. And hopefully my partner's forehand is better than my opponent's forehand. So that's why we hit up the line. Another direction that we hit the ball is up the middle of the kitchen. And you'll see the pros do this all the time whenever they're pulled off of the court. This is a great location to hit and here's why. So if I'm pulled off the court, they dink me way out here, I'm not far out enough to ATP the ball, I want to put that ball back in the middle. And the reason for that is because whenever I put that ball back in the middle, I don't have to recover as far. So I put that ball back in the middle, I only have to really recover to about here, which is gonna be super easy for me to do. Whereas, if I then dink that ball back cross court after being pulled off the court, and I dink it way over there, they just hit a winner. Before I could even slightly get back to where I need to be, which is probably gonna be about right here, like how we talked about earlier. So the reason that we dink up the middle is to get back into the point whenever we're pulled off the court. It can also be a great strategy to use to just change things up. You can dink to any of these locations to change it up. Number five, if the ball goes high, we always wanna move back and put our paddle down. Like I said earlier, a lot of people will have their feet stuck in cement, so they pop the ball and then they just take whatever comes back at them. They do not move. And this is a really bad strategy because anytime that the ball goes high, it's obviously going to be coming downwards at us. So the further back that we move, the better ability that we'll have to be able to defend that ball. So like I said, whenever the ball goes high, we wanna not only go back, but also put our paddle low. Because our opponents have to hit it into the court, it's not gonna make sense to have our paddle up here as we go back. If my paddle is up here as I go back and they hit it at my paddle, it's obviously going out. So I would wanna have my paddle in the optimal position to be able to defend that shot. Anytime you pop up the ball, we're back and our paddle is low. Notice how I'm facing towards my opponents with my feet. My entire body is towards my opponents. I'm not doing this. Pop up the ball and then I'm ready for it. I'm getting back so that I'm always facing towards my opponents. Now, if my lob is high enough, let's say that it's like really high, absolutely run back really quick. And as you guys can see, hopefully you have a lot of wind and then that happens. But if it's super high and you have the time, turn around, run, 
and then continue to face your opponents. But what I'm talking about is the pop-up where you're at the kitchen, you're dinking, you notice your dink goes a little high. You're gonna be able to get back to about here by the time they make contact with the ball. So you're definitely not gonna to wanna to turn around. Instead, you're gonna take a step back, split step, make sure that you're facing towards wherever the ball is. Making sure that our paddle is low so that we're defending the court. Not necessarily defending ourselves, we're defending wherever that red is on the court. Number six, if you keep the ball low, always recover and hover over the kitchen. So whenever I'm dinking against my opponents, if I keep the ball low and at their feet, it's not gonna make any sense for me to retreat. Instead, I'm going to recover towards the ball and then hover over the kitchen. I'm looking to attack, I'm looking to take the ball out of the air. I'm not looking to make bad decisions necessarily, but I'm looking to take any attackable ball and apply pressure on my opponents. The player that applies the most pressure is oftentimes the player that's going to win the point. So the way that we do that is if I'm dinking cross court again, say I dink cross court, I follow the ball, and then I was supposed to go cross court. There's a huge crosswind today. You guys can probably tell with how crazy my hair is. But I dink that cross court. I'm then going to follow the ball. I'm leaning over the kitchen. I'm bending my knees and I'm reaching, okay? I'm trying to apply that pressure. Make them feel like the kitchen is really small. And that always gets people to tense up and pop the ball up. Something, someone that's really, really good at this in the pros is Tyson McGuffin. He makes the kitchen feel extremely small. And the funny thing is, is Tyson's actually a pretty short guy. Okay, he doesn't have a ton of reach to get in the kitchen, but he utilizes every inch that God has given him because he gets in to that kitchen even though he's not that tall. And he applies that extra pressure and makes the opponent make mistakes just because they feel like the kitchen is so small. So every time that you dink and you keep the ball low, I want you to remember, recover and hover and be ready to pounce on that ball. And then here's a quick hack to help you to be able to reach further into the kitchen. If you're standing at the kitchen, let's say you recover and hover, but you're standing with your knees locked, this is how far in you'll be able to reach. Obviously, if you're my same exact height, but you get the point. If you bend your knees, you'll be able to reach in another six inches or so. As you can see how, how much further my paddle went forward from standing straight up to bending my knees. So just doing that simple knee bend will help you to be able to apply more pressure on your opponents and come out on top of more points. And that brings us to the last basic pickleball tactic, and that is the ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal of pickleball? Obviously, it's to win. And the best way to win is to get your butt to the kitchen line. It's basic geometry that the closer that you get to the net, the more angles and the more opportunities you have to hit downwards on the ball and win the point. Whereas the further back that you stand, the less angles that you have and the more that you have to hit upwards on the ball. So if you ever wanna have an advantage on your opponents, don't hang back. Whenever you return the ball, run to the net. Whenever you hit the third shot of the rally as the server, run to the net. Get up to the net as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that you can have that same advantage as your opponents. So just to show you a super basic example, if my opponents hit this high over the net, I can obviously hit down on that ball. So I can put the ball easily away and hit down on the ball because they hit this high over the net. Only problem is they hit that high over the net and I'm standing back here, ball's slowly coming down, lands in the court, and now I can't put that ball away because I'm not in an optimal position. I'm actually in a defensive position, and they're in charge of the point. So in order for me to be in charge, I have to then move up so that I can then take these balls out of the air. Is every ball gonna come at that height? Absolutely not. People are gonna be in dink battles. And you're trying to set yourself up as the ultimate goal to hit an optimal shot so that you can put the ball away. The only way that you can do that is if you get up to the kitchen line. When you're up at the kitchen line, you have more angles to work with and you'll have way more opportunities to hit down on the ball. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure to check out this video right here. I just barely uploaded it. It's seven offensive dinking strategies that only pros use. I promise that as you use them, you're gonna absolutely dominate the kitchen and win more points. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you on the next one.